Yes, yes, the Lord is good. He's with us, right? Uh, it's fantastic to be in his house and with his people. So we're going to, now that we have come to his presence, you see, this is the order of worship, that we enter his gates, right? We come all the way. We cross to where there used to be a veil, right, which was torn for us. And now we enter into his presence. So we're seated right before his throne, right at the feet of Rabbi Yeshua. And he is ready now to open the word and teach us. He's going to use a very humble, very broken servant. But I'm going to do my best to do him justice. Okay. So we're going to be today continuing with our series that we started last week that we are calling Sanctuary. So for the rest of the book of uh, Exodus, we are going to, to talk about the building or the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and then the actual building of it. Uh, we have two portions that speak about the instructions, then two portions of the actual building of the tabernacle. And in the middle of it, we actually have what we, what we know as the golden calf. So that passage will actually be next week, and I'm still praying to see, Lord, you want me to teach that portion or just skip it since we're going to have the Esther forum. Uh, and so I'll let you know in two weeks what he said, <laughs> whether I'm going to be in Exodus 32, 33, 34, because it's wonderful teaching there, or if we are actually going to skip uh, all the way to, I believe it's 35, where it, where it picks up again the building of the tabernacle. So, But uh, today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 28. So the portion begins at the end of 27. It goes uh, 28, 29, and part of 30. And uh, when I began to study for this, this portion and see what the Lord highlighted for me to share it with you, uh, I usually, I like to put it on, on audio, so I, you know, go into uh, the audio Bible and start listening to it and see what the Lord quickens for me. Uh, and immediately when it begins to talk about the, the garments of the priest in chapter 28, I knew that was the passage the Lord had for us. And so I began to to bathe in that word and to listen to him and to develop the thoughts that he uh, wants me for, uh, for me to share with you. And we're going to be there in chapter 28 then. Now, keep in mind, though, that this is still within the context of the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. If you were with us last week, uh, we talked about how the Lord showed Moses a pattern for the building of the tabernacle but we saw very clearly throughout scripture, we went all the way to the book of Hebrews and back and forth. And we saw how this pattern that the Lord showed Moses is actually heaven itself. The very presence of the Lord. And so as Moses is looking at this pattern and the Lord is pointing out uh, the different uh, furnishings and utensils that are used in heaven... Uh, for the worship, then he comes upon a person, and that is the high priest. He sees Yeshua. And the instructions are for him to develop a set of garments that are going to depict who Yeshua is and how he officiates as a priest, as a high priest in heaven. So we're going to continue to learn how heaven operates. And today specifically, how Yeshua himself operates in heaven as a high priest. And we're going to, we're not going to look at all the possible details, but we're just going to focus on the clothing, the garments that he has on himself. So, Exodus 28, 
uh, verse 1. The, the title for the message today um, is actually Dressed with Life. Dressed with Life. Now, you've heard of Dress to Kill. This is the opposite. <laughs> this is the opposite. We're going to see how the priest is dressed with life. So, verse 1, Exodus 28. Exodus 28. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 5, making comments on some of the, um, the wording there and some of the Hebrew words. And then we're going to do a, a, a short, quick survey of the whole chapter. Then we'll come back to focus on a couple of things uh, in this chapter. There's just so, so much, but the Lord highlighted a couple of things, uh, beautiful things here in this uh, passage for us to understand some of the, the garments that the high priest had to wear. Verse 1. Then, here the Lord continues to instruct Moses, bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priests to me. This is a family affair. Bring your brother, bring your family, your cousins, your, your, your nephews. Um, don't know where you're at with relating to your family. Uh, but this is, a, this is a, a family affair. And the Lord says, I want you to bring them near to you. This actually reminds me of Paul in 1 Corinthians when he says, be imitators of me as I am imitator of Yeshua, the Messiah. Draw near to the Lord like I do. Come with me. Let me take you by the hand. Let me show you how to enter the presence of the Lord. We do this with children. Uh, we used to um, gather our kids around when they were, when they were smaller, and uh, now everybody's off to the next uh, sport activity and all that stuff. It's really hard to get everybody <laughs> together. Um, but uh, we used to gather them together and we say, okay, now we're going to hear God. We're going to learn how to hear God. We're gonna, we, will, we will do um, uh, healing prayer for each other. So they will pray for healing for each other and pray for people that we knew that needed healing. Uh, or we will do prophetic words. So we will gather them together and hear God and speak to each other words that the Lord is speaking to them about the other. And uh, so this was a way to bring them near to the Lord, uh, just as we were growing, uh, coming near to him. So this is a family affair, Moses and his brother and his uh, nephews. And it names them here. We know, we know some of these names, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. Uh-oh. This one didn't end too well, but we'll get there a little later. Uh, Eliezer and Itamar. Uh, Aaron's sons. Verse 2, you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother. And it says that it is for glory and for beauty. I love this expression. Make the garments for glory and for beauty. The word glory here is this, the, the regular word for the glory of God. As it would descend and come upon them. How would the garments reflect the glory of God? That's amazing. You see, the word for glory really means the weightiness, the heaviness. We, we talk about, especially here in these uh, political seasons that we're going through, we talk about how politicians love to throw their weight around, <laughs> right? Let you know who they are and how important they are, what they've done and, you know, what offices they hold. This is God throwing his weight around. His glory, his weightiness. You see, it is discerning who is this person that's in front of me. Who is he? Can you imagine clothing that would communicate that, communicate who the Lord is, his weightiness, his importance, who he is, his glory. How do you do that? How do you create that kind of clothing? 
That's just fascinating to me. So, make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Verse 3. You shall, you shall speak to all the skillful persons. This is how you do it. You shall speak to all the... Here, the word is actually to all those who are wise of heart. That's, that's the Hebrew here. Wise of heart. Okay, what's the correlation between wisdom and being able to make clothing that reflect the glory of God? What, what would be the correlation there? Well, I think, I think we can understand this uh, when we uh, borrow from another aspect of the arts. Because we're speaking here about art, about how to create this clothing that are beautiful, right, for beauty, for glory. So what, what I think it, it helps us understand is the world of music. It's a little easier for us to, let's say, think of Steve and Renata, right? How they can get into the presence of God and hear the Lord and, and receive from him. And then they come and they write these lyrics that are amazing. Uh, I don't know if you realize, but the song that we sang to the second song, Adonai, that's the song that they actually wrote. And even the song at the end of the, of the liturgy, Yeshua here, we love that song, don't we? They wrote that one, too, along with um, David and Micah, who are not here today with us, but they're a regular part of our worship team as well. And even, even uh, Cynthia had a part in that. So we understand how the glory of God can be translated into lyrics and into beautiful music, harmonies, and, and melodies. So how do you do that translation, right, the glory of God, and you depict it in art form, in, in the form of clothing? That's amazing. Well, you see, you go and find people who are wise of heart, who understand what holiness is about. These are holy garments. So they understand, they have the wisdom to discern what is holiness, what is holy, and what is not. Have you ever seen people dressed in a way that clearly is not holy? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> we can do it the other way as well. Clothing that depict holiness and we'll get it we'll get a, a a little deeper into that so make holy garments from Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty you shall speak to all the wise of heart people who are wise of heart whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom endowed with the spirit of wisdom the word endowed here is actually filled I have filled them with the spirit of wisdom but in the Hebrew, this is actually intensified. So the grammatical construction is intensified. What, what would that look like? If I tell you, okay, picture the verb to fill and now make it more intense. What would that look like? Well, if you're filling up a, a, a cup and you really want to intensify it, you would just overflow it. So the Lord filled these people with so much, with so much of his spirit that these people were overflowing with the spirit of wisdom, overflowing. They were so wise. It was, it was so obvious. It was so evident in their words, in their walk, the way they treated people. I'm not talking about being super saint or super religious. No, I'm talking about super loving. That's really what I'm talking about. People who are filled with the Spirit are people who are filled with the fruit of the Spirit, with love, shalom, joy, and you can see it in them, right? These people were overflowing. It's like you were sprinkled. If you were around them, you were sprinkled with that stuff they were overflowing with. Uh, and so that's the kind of people that can actually translate holiness 
into garments. All right, we'll, we'll return to that thought. So they're endowed with the spirit of wisdom that they, that they make, so instruct them that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister as priest to me. Again, second time that this phrase is used here, to minister as priest to me. Verse 4. These are the garments which they, they shall make. A, so here we're going to have a list. A breast piece and an ephod and a robe and a tunic of checkered work, a turban and a sash, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister as priest to me. Third time. It's got to be important for the Lord to repeat this phrase three times in just four verses. To minister to me as priest. We'll come back to that. So verse 5 closes it out by saying, They shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen. And this is what they're going to work with to make all of this stuff. All right. So now I'm going to show you real quick how the whole chapter then gives us the details of how every piece of these um, garments and and things were actually done. So in verse uh, 6, 28.6, if we can put the slide that has all of them, yeah, so you have them on the screen there. So verse 6, it says, they shall also make the ephod. So that's one thing, the ephod. And we see that in verses 6 through 14. In verse 15, it says, you shall make a breast piece. That's second item, right? Verses 15 through 30. Then in verse 31, it says, you shall make the robe. So that goes 31 through 35. And then in verse 36, you shall also make a plate of pure gold. Wait a minute. A plate of pure gold, that was not in the original instruction, right? But the Lord is adding this. As, a, as part of the turban. So we, we, we know they're supposed to make a turban. And we're going to return back to this plate, uh, a plate of pure gold. In verse 39, it says, you shall, you shall weave the tunic of checkered work. That's one item of fine linen. And shall make a turban. That's another item of fine linen. And you shall make a sash. That's another item, the work of a weaver. Verse 40. For Aaron's sons, for Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics. You shall also make sashes for them, and you shall make caps for them. Okay, the caps also what was not in the original, uh, verse four or ver- yeah, I think it was verse four. So the Lord's adding uh, uh, particulars to uh, the uh, generic instructions that He gave at the beginning. Then verse 42, it's going to get a little funny, so bear with me, right? Verse 42, you shall make for them linen breeches. Okay, we'll move on, since Mark Davis didn't get it, so. <laughs> so cover these guys from the inside out, uh, even to the intimate parts, so that, again, so that the holiness of the Lord will not be compromised when they go in and serve uh, inside the sanctuary. Alrighty, so I want us to focus then, before we focus on a couple of these things, I want us to first understand the meaning of dressing or the meaning of garments. Because what we have here is a metaphor. What we have here is metaphorical. These things, they stand for something. And if we don't understand what they stand for, then we've walked away without really fulfilling what the what the reading was intended to 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 do to give us understanding so it's like you sit at the table and you have conversation and and you stand up and you walk away but you didn't eat (laughs) what's up with that (laughs) right so we read we walk away and it's like what did you understand what was the revelation here and it's like, uh, I don't know. 
Uh, we don't do, I don't know, here at Sukkot, right? We go into the text, and we want to receive revelation from the Lord. So we're going to get into a couple of these things, but I want us to understand first the meaning, the metaphorical meaning of dressing and of clothing. Um, so let's look at, real quick, at a couple of passages here. Psalm 109, verse 18. Psalm 109, verse 18. It says, But he clothed himself with cursing as with his garment. This is the psalmist, the psalmist speaking of his enemy. He clothed himself with cursing as with his garment. And it entered into his body like water. So the cursing entered into his body like water and like oil into his bones. Wow, this is like really intense. But it all depends on the the first metaphor here. And actually, because it uses the word as, this is actually a simile. So you remember this in school? A simile and a metaphor? The difference is the metaphor does not use the word like or as. The metaphor just goes straight for it. You know, you can say the man that man is like a lion. Or you can say, that man is a lion, right? Uh, in the end, it's pretty much the same. But the form of it, the grammatical form, differs. So here, he clothed himself with cursing as with a garment. So what does that mean again? All right, so we'll, we'll um, unpack it a little more. But I want us to see again another another. Uh, passage. Isaiah 61, verse 10. It says, here's the Lord speaking. Or, or here's uh, uh, Isaiah speaking about the Lord's work for him. It says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. So here it's not using the word like or as, but garments of salvation right like saying a shirt that is salvation that speaks salvation that it's the the thought is it has to be unpacked for us to understand what does that mean he continues to say he wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels so speaking of a wedding right this is the day that you dress the best in your life the best especially for ladies right you dress the best that's your day that's your wedding day you will never again dress better than what you did or what you do at your wedding so he's saying this is how god dresses people he makes them look the best they ever looked with righteousness, with salvation. So what does that mean for God to dress us? All right, Isaiah 59. One more passage and then we'll, we'll unpack what, what this actually means. Isaiah 59, 17, it says, He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. Wow, this is serious stuff. Garments of vengeance for clothing. And wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. So this is God himself. All right. So dressing actually has to do with a characteristic of a person that is prominent about them so a characteristic of a person who is prominent about them at that particular moment um, or on a regular basis let me I, I think I have a thought that can help us understand it in today's terms if we see a person who is let's say depressed sad or even angry, upset, 
we could, we would say, well, uh, he has sadness written all over him. Meaning this thing is characterizing him or her uh, to a great extent at this moment. It's very prominent. It's very obvious that this person is it's dominated at this time or, or at regular times by this. So it's written all over him. It's written all over her. I think that's the meaning of dressing. So when we go back, let's say to Psalm 109, but he clothed himself with cursing as with a garment, we could say, wow, that person has cursing written all over them. It's so obvious. Or Psalm 60, 61, I'm sorry, Isaiah 61. The Lord has clothed me with garments of salvation. The, the thought of the moment in which I came to know him is so prominent. I have such joy. And it is so uh, on the surface with me. The moment of my salvation. The fact that he saved me. Or maybe maybe the fact that the, the, the moment when he rescued me. He did, he did something big. Let's say healing. Right? He healed me. Wow. This is so prominent about me. And I'm talking about it and uh, I... I I, you, you see it all over me. Uh, Isaiah 59. He put on righteousness like a breastplate. Righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, if you hang out for a while with us here at Sakad, and you, you know that what we teach here is that righteousness is actually love. Right, righteousness is love. And I'll show it to you real quick. You see, a person is righteous, not when he is religious or when he checked the boxes, I've done this and that and the other, but a person is righteous when they love God. Like truly, they obey him. They, you know, not, not to perfection, but a person is righteous when they also love people. You see, righteousness really is love. That's why Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, he says that love is what the fulfillment of the Torah. That's righteousness. So here, here's a person that righteousness for them is like a breastplate. They're wearing this love. And it protects them. It protects them from the arrows of the enemy. Right? From, let me put it in today's terms. It, they're not easily offended. Because they love God. They're not offended at God. But Lord, why this happened to me? Um, um, some of you know my, uh, my youngest son. Uh, broke his, uh, fractured his knee playing basketball. And he had to have emergency surgery, and he's doing well now. And the doctor, actually, we were at the doctor a couple of weeks ago, and the doctor was really surprised how well he's healing, how the muscles are preserved and all of that stuff. And obviously, he's looking forward to returning back to football. That's, that's what he does. That's what he loves. And so... Um, but that day when he, when this happened to him, you know, we're about to enter, in, he's about to enter surgery, and he finally breaks down, and he says, Dad, wh why do you think the Lord allowed this to happen to me? And so Michelle and I were able to minister to him, pray with him, and you know, he's never mentioned it again. Never. 
his love for the Lord, his understanding of his lordship protects him like a breastplate from the darts of the enemy. And so he wears this. It's, it's obvious by the fact that he never again uh, expressed anything close to being offended at what God allowed in his life, right? It works too with people, right? If we bear this love as a breastplate, it protects us. It doesn't mean people are not going to do stuff to us, right? It doesn't mean that when you drive on the road, they're not going to cut in front of you. It does not mean that. <laughs> but it means that you, the work is done in you, and you wear this. It is so obvious. It's written all over you. You have patience, and you, you have understanding. You're wise. All right. So I think we understand a little now the meaning of of garments and God dressing us or us dressing ourselves with certain characteristics that are so prominent about us. So let's return now to see a couple of the items that were in the wardrobe, so to speak, of the priests. Before we do that, though, I still need to share one more thing with you because we're looking at this uh, uh, how the people of wise hearts, right, how these people who are so overflowing with the spirit of wisdom, how can they translate glory, holiness into artistic clothing? How, how does that happen? And what does it have to do with wisdom? Why does it have to be people of wise hearts and filled with the spirit of wisdom? Okay, so I need to share with you first what holiness really is. Because we have a little concept that I I, 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 I don't like it when I hear it. It's like, ah, that's not what it means. Because we've been taught all of our lives that holiness is what? Separation. That being holy is set apart from the world unto God. And the problem is that's only partially true. It's, it's the effect of holiness, but it's not the heart, the essence of it. So the best way I have to share with you real quick and in a way that we can understand is by talking about the three liquids in Scripture that shows us and that, that teach us about holiness. All right, so number one is water. You see, water in scripture isn't just water. It is living water, right? It is actually running water. It's not stagnant water, but it has to be running water for it to be living. It's moving. It has life in it, right? It's healthy. So you apply water on a person who is unclean, and what happens? The uncleanness goes away. Now, what's interesting is that uncleanness is almost always, not 100%, but almost always related to death. Uncleanness is almost always related to death. So death, uh, some sort of, some level of death has attached itself to you. So you are unclean. And the solution is to apply living water on you. So the living water works like a detergent, right? It comes in and it wipes off the death, but it infuses you with life. Kind of like the detergent, right? You, you wipe it off, and then at the end, your plate, your, your whatever that you wash, it smells good, right? It has the fragrance of whatever detergent you prefer. So you wipe off one thing, one substance, death, and you infuse another one, which is life. Same thing happens with blood. Living water, running water, and then also blood. Um, for blood, I'm going to go into uh, Leviticus. There it is. There's Leviticus. Leviticus 17, verse 11. Yeah, this is what I do. 
<laughs> if you don't know, I'm the Leviticus nerd. So that's why they're laughing. Because I always find a way to tie it somehow to Leviticus. So, But in a few weeks, I won't have to do that because the text will be Leviticus. <laughs> so I'm going to preach with all my heart. Uh, Leviticus 17.11, probably the most important verse in Scripture, from my opinion, or at least the, the most important from the Hebrew Scriptures to be able to understand Yeshua's work and how God works to save us. Leviticus 17.11, it says, just uh, one part, it says, well, let me read it all. I don't have it all in my notes, but let's read it all on the screen. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar. I've given you the blood to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. And it says, for, explaining it, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. It is the blood by reason of the life. So if you could take blood turn it around, look on the back, and read the ingredients. It will say, active ingredient of blood is life. The blood makes atonement only because it has life, by reason of the life. So, we have the same case as with water, except that water takes care of of Low-level uncleanness. Blood takes care of severe uncleanness. Now you have a little uncleanness that is a little more, more important. So blood, again, wipes off death, and it infuses life. And then we come to the third liquid, which is oil. You see, oil is the highest possible level of infusion with life because you anoint the priest so that he can enter into the holy of holies you need the water the blood and the oil to be able to enter into the presence of god you need to be infused with such a level of life that you can enter That is holiness. Holiness is being infused, overflowing with life. That's holiness. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When he fills you and you are infused with him and and you overflow with who he is, guess what happens? Life is flowing out of you. Love, peace, joy, patience, all qualities of life is abundance of life. What flows out of you because of the Holy Spirit, because he's infused you with life, with holiness. Now we are prepared to understand, to discern these garments that the priest was supposed to wear. Because we read in, in, um, if we can go back to um, the very beginning of the notes, in verse um, 3, actually uh, verse 2, if you can get it over there, Mario, verse 2, yes. You shall make holy garments. How in the world are you supposed to make holy garments? How do you do that? How do you take holy? What is holy? Is it a piece of cloth? What exactly, what material is holy? Holiness. Oh, but now you understand what holiness is. So those of wise heart, those overflowing with the spirit of wisdom, they know. They know how to discern 
life. They know what life is supposed to look like and manifest, even in artistic ways. And they're going to create art with the, for the garment, with the, the clothing and the materials they have in a way that expresses life, that expresses life. Now, it's still, it's still kind of too abstract, so I'm going to break it down a little more. Uh, Michelle and I were driving home last night, and, and it was, I don't know if you saw it, it's a beautiful sunset, just beautiful. Um, when I was young and I went to Bible school in Colombia, remember, I'm from the south, right? I'm from Venezuela, way south. <laughs> uh, I went to Bible school even further south. I went to Colombia. And the Bible school was actually in a little town which had an Indian name. And it's kind of hard to pronounce, so I'm not even going to try it. But the, the meaning of the name was it actually meant sunsets of blood, and so you can imagine, it was every afternoon, it was beautiful in that place. Well, we had one of those here in Texas last night. It was beautiful. And, and I, as I'm meditating, and actually Michelle and I were talking about, you know, you, she always wants to know, okay, so what are you going to teach? And, and it's, it helps me because if she doesn't understand what I'm trying to say, chances are you won't understand what I'm trying to say. So it helps me, okay, I need to go back and reword this because I'm not explaining it correctly. So um, and so we were talking about precisely that, you know, how that sunset has the power to encourage you and me, to communicate beauty, right? The garments were for glory and for beauty. It communicates beauty. It, it brings encouragement. It gives you hope. If you're having a hard day, hard day and you're driving home from work and, and you see the sunset, somehow it causes you to feel better. Guess what that is? It's life. At the, at the very essence, when you keep going back and back and back to what is this, you're going to arrive at life. God infuses us with life through the beautiful things that he creates. That's how you translate holiness, life, into a garment. So you're going to create, to create patterns, colors, beautiful thing that when someone sees it, it is encouraging. It's uplifting. It ministers life and beauty and glory. All right. How do you like my introduction? <laughs> Let's get to work now. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm hungry. Just like you are, so I won't take long. <laughs> so let's go to verse 29. Exodus 28, verse 29. I want us to talk about the breast piece. That element of the, of the things that Aaron was supposed to wear. So in verse 29 it says, Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment. Stop right there. <laughs> We're jumping into the middle. We, we don't have time to get into all of the details that come before that. But I want us to look at this, the name of the breastpiece. It isn't just the breastpiece. It is the breastpiece of judgment. What does that mean? Well, if you are a Sukkot veteran, then you've been in our Torah study, you know what we teach about judgments here at Sukkot. And if you want to catch up, you can always go to our YouTube uh, channel as I advertise, right? I'm, a, I'm relentless, right? <laughs> um, because we teach about judgments. In fact, the book of Exodus, just a few chapters before this, 
is the passage on judgments. And in Hebrew, they're called the Mishpatim. So we have them in Exodus 20, 21, 22, 23. Case after case, 42 cases of the Mishpatim. And when you analyze what that means, it's actually in the end, and I'll give you, I'll give you the final product, not so much the process. Someday we'll go through the process. But I'll give you the final product, what this means. And it is issuing compassionate decisions. The judges, I don't know if you recall um, Solomon. Uh, a very hard case was brought to Solomon. He's a king. He's a judge. And the two women are claiming, no, this is my child. No, 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 this is my child. No, no, this is my child. What is he to do? There's no DNA. <laughs> so he says, okay, bring me a sword. I'm going to cut this child in half. Knowing that the true mother was going to show compassion and say, no, it's okay. I'd rather he lives, even if it is without me, just give it to her. And then the judge knew who the real mother was. And that's the essence, to issue then a ruling that shows compassion to the person who is being oppressed. When you read the cases in Exodus 21 to, through 23, and in fact, all throughout Scripture, that's what judgments is about. It's about bringing restoration, finding out who is being wronged here and what needs to be done for this person to receive uh, release from oppression. So Aaron is supposed to wear a breast piece of compassion of decisions that are to free people from oppression. So let's keep reading. It says, Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment of compassion and decisions over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually, continually every day, morning and afternoon, continually. He goes in so that the Lord remembers Remembers what? To have compassion over Israel. To deliver Israel from their oppressors. So he has this written all over him. For the Lord to read it. Lord, have compassion over Israel. Deliver us from our enemies. Verse 30. You shall put in the breast piece of judgment... The Urim and Tumim. Oh, now we got like, okay, now we have hard thing to understand all over again. You know, what is this? Okay, we're going to get into this a little bit. Uh, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel, the compassionate decisions that he is pleading with the Lord to issue over Israel. He's to carry it over his, his heart before the Lord continually. Right. So the Urim and Tumim is part of this. So let's read about it real quick. Numbers 27, verse 15. Numbers 27, it says, Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, May the Lord, the God of, of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation. This is Moses getting ready to be go home with the Lord. Verse 17 who will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom the spirit, on whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him and have him stand before Eliezer, the priest, and before all the congregation and commission him in their sight, you shall put some of your authority on him in order that all the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. Moreover, he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, 
who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. So Joshua is supposed to come before the priest to inquire of the Lord. And with the Urim and Tumim, the priest is supposed to give Joshua the Lord's decision. This is what David did every time he went to war. I don't know if you remember reading the stories of David. He would go on to the priest, and he, here's what he would ask. Should I go and strike the, whoever it was at that time, the Amalekites, the, the uh, uh, Philistines? And through the Urim and Tumim, the Lord would issue a decision to David and said, no or yes, I have given them into your hand. Why? Because they were Israel's oppressors. So the Lord is using a compassionate decision through these Urim and Tumim, these stones that were stones, uh, that would give a yes or no answer from the Lord to tell them, yes, go, because I've delivered them into your hands. Or, no, don't go, I have not delivered them into your hands. So don't you dare, because you will be the oppressor. Or, yes, I'm about to deliver Israel from their oppressors. Go. So you see that how it ties in the compassionate decision, the Urim and Tumim, and how uh, what we're looking at here is, is really coming before the Lord to receive a word from him, to hear the Lord. I need to hear the Lord in this matter so that I know what to do, how to proceed, so that whatever I do comes from his mouth. I know it will succeed. If I do what, if I hear him and I do what he says, I know it will succeed. But if I simply go on my own, I may end up hurting the person I'm going to talk to. I don't know about you. I do this all of the time, and especially with my kids. When I go in without a word, I'm going to misjudge them. I'm going to assume they had the wrong motive. It's, it's not good. It's really hard. You've got to be so close so you can hear, have a word, so that when you go and talk to them, you're going to speak life. So you're going to minister freedom, deliver them from their oppressors, and you speak life over them. So you have compassion written all over you because you heard him, you got a word from him, and then you go in and you minister and you talk to people. So, the garments, all of these different aspects of the garment of the priest is supposed to communicate life. And in this case, life was translated into compassionate decisions over people who are oppressed. That's what we're supposed to do as priests. We minister life, compassionate decisions from the Lord to people who are oppressed so that they see that understanding and compassion is written all over us. And they see the garments that we wear. Okay, last one. I want to talk to you about the the uh, turban and the and the the plate the golden plate that is on the turban okay so exodus 28 36 we're gonna this is gonna be the last portion we're gonna talk about just in case you're thinking what you know what 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 am i gonna eat uh, when i get out of here so <laughs> talking to you mark davis that's yeah you know <laughs> all right verse 36 you shall also make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal, holy to the Lord. 
That's what you're to engrave on it. Kodesh Ladonai. Holy to the Lord. That's what you're going to put. So it's this, this golden plate, you're going to put it on the turban. We're going to read that in a moment. It says you shall fasten it, verse 37, on a blue cord, and it shall be on the turban. It shall be at the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall take away the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel consecrate with regard to all their holy gifts, and it shall, and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Did you catch all of that? Well, if you thought we were going to go real quick to lunch, I, I <laughs> how are we going to explain this? Uh, did you read that? Let's read it again. Look, it says, verse uh, 38, It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall, Aaron shall take away the iniquity of the holy things. Wait a minute. The holy things have iniquity? That's what it says. And then it says, which the sons of Israel consecrate or make holy. So here's the things that the people of Israel bring into the tabernacle. Remember, the instruction for them was bring gold and silver and bronze and material and all of this so that I can build the tabernacle. So they're building, they're bringing all of these things. Are you telling me these things somehow have iniquities in them? How is, how, what does that even mean? <laughs> I thought iniquity is what a person does. How can I, if I bring my gold watch, you know, to the temple so they can melt it and build the tabernacle, how does that have iniquity in it? You see the predicament here? And then it gets worse. Look, it says, or better, right? <laughs> it says, the, the holy things which the, the sons of Israel consecrate with regard to all the, their holy gifts. So with the holy gifts, they are bringing, uh, have iniquity in them. And somehow Aaron, by wearing the plate that says holiness to the Lord, somehow this takes away the iniquities that are in the gifts that the people bring and consecrate to the Lord for the tabernacle. Whew. How, does, how are we going to get out of this? <laughs> how are we going to resolve this? Well, I have a little story for you that I think can help us. You remember Jacob and Esau. Jacob ended up leaving, spending 20 years. When he's coming back, he's afraid of his brother, right? And it says that he sent, in front of him, he sent gifts. So a bunch of camels and a bunch of donkeys and a bunch of stuff he sent. And the text says that these were mincha. Mincha. Leviticus chapter 2 is the grain offering, but obviously he was sending animals. This is, it's all, it, it actually uh, speaks of a gift. So when you come before a king, you don't come empty handed, you bring a gift. And this, one of the words for this gift is a mincha, a gift. So, similar to what the people of Israel are doing, they're bringing gifts for the construction of the tabernacle. And what we're thinking is these gifts somehow have iniquities attached to them. What is an iniquity anyway? An iniquity is a bent that I have towards a certain behavior that I inherited. You know, that's why we talk about generational iniquities. I will visit the iniquities of your fathers on the sons and to the fourth generation. These are patterns of life contrary to the word of God that I need freedom from. So 
the gifts that I bring somehow are somehow tainted by these patterns of life that I still need freedom from. All right, let's go back to Jacob because it, it becomes too abstract. With the story, I think you'll get it at least a little bit. <laughs> so Jacob is afraid of Esau and he sends gifts ahead of himself to appease his brother. And amazingly, the, it uses the word appease, but the word there is to make atonement <laughs> for himself in, you know, with his brother. But atonement, we saw it, is to infuse life. So the gifts that he is giving is to encourage his brother to, you know, see him in a good light, to somehow affect him. But the gifts come out of fear. And that's the iniquity attached to his gift. Have you ever given for the wrong reasons? <laughs> I have. Either out of fear or, you know, to get on the good grace, you know, or to expect something. Or you, you've given to the wrong person for your own motives. You know, rather than giving this to well, you know, this person, or let's say inviting someone home, you know, wh who would you invite? The person who can return the invitation, maybe has a better house than you, you know, can get you in with so-and-so, but having, you know, go, taking someone else to lunch that it's, it's not really a significant person. You know, how, how is that going to promote your career? <sighs> no, you'd rather invite the person that you can get a benefit from. So you see how you are giving something with an iniquity attached to it. <laughs> you see how that's possible? So it is very much possible to give to the Lord with something of a wrong motivation, something of an iniquity whether it's fear, but there's something deficient about it. And that's the good news. That Aaron, by wearing this gold plate that says holiness to the Lord, holy to the Lord, somehow wipes off the iniquity associated with your gift and my gift. Let me put it this way. Love covers a multitude of sins. That's enough. The gentle answer diffuses wrath. You are able with your love, which is life, you are able to somehow almost like cleanse a bad situation. You cover for your brother that maybe didn't have the right reason for doing this. You overlook it. In your maturity, you overlook it. You're good with it. When we come here together, there are so many moving parts, so many people doing so many things. So many details here in worship. They will tell you, oh, it was terrible. And you're like, what are you talking about? It was awesome worship. And they will tell you, yeah, but you don't know what went wrong. And this went wrong. And that went wrong. And all of this. Or the guys in the back, whoosh, you have no idea. All the stuff that messed up over there with all the technical stuff. And so an offering that is very much imperfect the high priest receives it with love. <laughs> and you, as priest, you receive it with love. That it makes the gift that has some sort of iniquity attached to it, 
it makes it okay. And it says that the Lord accepted, meaning he actually is pleased with it. So when you and I wear life, when it's written all over us, that we're patient, we are understanding, that we just roll with it, don't make a big deal out of it, that we cover, we protect, we got it, we, we've got each other's back. All of that is our garment as priests to infuse life and to cover for one another. Is that good? That's us as priests. That's already who we are. So our daily life, our experience needs to catch up with our reality, who we are. So we operate not from deficiency, not from what I'm not, not from so much I still need to. No, we operate from who I already am. Remember, this is a picture of what heaven already is like. So I'm operating in the likeness of the one that I was created to. Amen. Let's pray.